floor now for questions for any of the three presenters.
per se. So I would say that at this point in time, there is no mutation other than the FDA approved pepperlizumab and, and uh, for microsatellite instability. There is no, let's say, genetic alteration that we know that we need to change or do therapy differently. So I'll give you an example uh, of this. and. Uh, so there was a, a study published in the United States from Maha Hussein's group and a study published from Kim Chi's group in, in, in Canada that looked at patients that had uh, PARP inhibitors with abiraterone. And in one study, those patients, um, you know, I'm sorry, let me restate that. Patients that had DNA repair abnormalities and got abiraterone, and in one study, the patients with abiraterone, with those that had DNA repair alterations, did better. In another study, they did significantly worse. So we don't know. I, I'll tell you what I think, and this is just complete guesswork without knowing uh, and along that lines. I think that having certain alterations, like these DNA repair alterations, might be a little bit like HER2 in breast cancer. So it's a poor prognostic marker but it might be pre also predictive for a response to certain therapies. So for instance, if you have a DNA repair abnormality in the old days, there's clearly literature to show that you're going to have a worse outcome. But now that we have so many newer therapies, I don't know that they, yeah, sure, they might respond to a PARP inhibitor, but maybe they respond super well to abiraterone or enzalutamide. This is all stuff that's kind of early, and the HOTS B13 is very, very interesting, but I think is even earlier right now, so. In, um, for Dr. Ball, when we have a patient with um, cutaneous squamous on the scalp, and that's treated and we're chasing it to other areas, also on this on the side, because I think for cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma more than other cancers, it's a lot harder to say when you're going for curative intent and when you're not, because you definitely do see these people that have multiple lesions pop up over time, you keep resecting and resecting, and, and eventually you, you run out of skin to repair. So I do think that would be, you know, we don't have an FDA approved option yet, first of all, so anything would be off-label use, but I do think that's a very reasonable situation to try an immunotherapy drug. I mean, the responses in the reported trial are about 50% in that setting. The case reports with the volumab and pembrolizumab are also looking at, you know, 50-60% response rates. And you see them quickly. So if you have a patient where you really think surgery has a very low chance of curing them, and I think it would be reasonable to give a short trial of PD-1 inhibitors first. We don't know yet about the durability of these responses in cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, but what we know from lung, from melanoma, are that if you get a response, it tends to be durable. So I think that would be reasonable versus putting someone through a very morbid surgery. I just want to add that there are adjuvant trials being planned in high risk cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma in non immune suppressed patients. All right, for Dr. Gold, can you just speak to what you're telling um, family members, partners of folks with HPV positive oral cancers about immunizations or testing? You're getting me on a soapbox here, I warn you. Um, but first of all, I really do feel like HPV testing should be standard. Everyone should get HPV testing. My bar is anyone that might possibly ever have oral, anal, or vaginal sex should have the HPV vaccine, and that really encompasses the entire population. So my children, they're too young right now, they're 18 months and four years old, but as soon as they hit nine years old, I'll take them to their pediatrician's office and get them vaccinated. So I do stress to the patients that once you have the cancer, it is too late to be vaccinated. Um, and right now, we have no screening. We don't have an oropharyngeal pap smear, although there are some people looking at that. It's very interesting, but it's not ready for prime time yet. Um, but the best way is to prevent, prevent the virus before it happens. So vaccinate your kids. Um, grandkids. Um, as far as behaviors go, you know, if I have a 65-year-old guy who's sitting there with his wife, first of all, they ask me about infidelity, like, hey, we've been together 40 years, was my husband cheating on me, and how, is that how they got this? No, I, I, I reassure them that that's not the case. This is probably a virus that they were exposed to in their early 20s. Almost everyone is exposed. Most people clear it. Um, looking at rates of persistent HPV infection in patients versus their partners, there's no increased risk of HPV infection in partners, so I don't recommend that they change their sexual practices in any way. Um, so I try to reassure them in that way. But yeah, vaccination, I think, is really how 
hopefully going to make me train for a new job sometime in the future. I would, I would love to see that for the kids. I have a question for Dr. Bhatia. Um, it, you showed that nice slide where you looked at those patients' response, uh, whether they're a BRAF mutant or for all comers there, and you said you had your preference. Um, for those uh, to receive IO therapy, right? Why in that study can't you just go back retrospectively and determine the BRAF mutant or wild type status? It seems like an early easy analysis to do. Has this just not been done yet? So immunotherapy works equally well in BRAF mutant and BRAF wild type. So that we don't so that's been well established. In pretty much all trials, subset analyses show no major difference uh, in immunotherapy. So I, if, if my treatment of choice for a patient is immunotherapy, I actually don't need BRAF mutations unless they're able to be Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brian, you have a question? Yes. Hey, for Dr. Bhatia, uh, a nice eulogy for Dr. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question is, given the 34% uh, questions? So I'll, I'll answer it. With my preference is I have not prescribed high dose IL-2 in the last five years for melanoma. My colleagues still use it in kidney cancer. Um, the only situation